Why I no longer go to church sermons like these. This is part two of my critique of Jeff Durbin's sermon, Absolute Proof of Christianity. Let's take a listen. And one of the things that I absolutely fell in love with regarding the Christian faith is just how intellectually rigorous it is. It's stunning, really. Jeff, do you think it's necessary for a scientist to say how intellectually rigorous the field of physics is or chemistry? Keep in mind that apologetics is not made to get people into the belief system. It's for people who are already in it. I think apologists like Jeff, one of their main jobs is to help young people today not feel stupid for what they believe. And I think this is exactly why he's making this point. And I've always had a passion for understanding why we believe what we believe. Now capture this for a moment. Isn't it true that the reason why you believe has nothing to do with what you're talking about in this sermon? You believe what you believe because you hit rock bottom as a youth and because you married a Christian woman, because you were raised in a Christian culture, and these are the main reasons you believe what you believe. Not because you found Christianity intellectually stunning or any of the other reasons we're about to hear. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life, no man comes to the Father but by me. There's a little part there in the middle there I want to hang on to right now. Jesus says he's the truth. God is truth. Jesus is the truth, which means, watch this, Christians have a reason for being absolutely committed to truth. Are you saying that non-Christians don't have a reason to be committed to truth? As a truth seeker, do you automatically believe that, number one, there was a man named Jesus who made that claim in the first place? And number two, if he did, why do you believe that's true, the statement itself? Do we have reasons to maybe believe that it isn't true? I love how C.S. Lewis puts it. Jesus was either a liar, a lunatic, or a lord. Do we have reasons to believe that Jesus was a liar or a lunatic? I think C.S. Lewis forgot a fourth option that maybe there was a man named Jesus who never made the claim in the first place. But let's look at the evidence and see if we have reasons to think that Jesus is maybe a liar or a lunatic. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or believe because of the miracles I have done. I can assure you that whoever believes in me will do the same things I have done, and they will do even greater things than I have done, because I am going to the Father, and if you ask for anything in my name, I will do it for you. Then the Father's glory will be shown through the Son. If you ask me for anything in my name, I will do it. Christians, do you believe that's true? Have you done greater things than Jesus? Have you done the same things as Jesus? Have you raised anybody from the dead? Have you made the blind to see? Have you asked for anything in Jesus' name and has it been given to you? Believe me when I say that there are some people standing here who will see the Son of Man coming with his kingdom before they die. Is that a true statement? Were there people there who saw the Son of Man coming with his kingdom before they died? Could that not be viewed as a lie? No, 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 Doug, you don't understand. You, you, that's not what it means. How could you understand these things, Doug? You are not a theologian. Jesus answered, You were not able to make the demon go out because your faith is too small. Believe me when I tell you, if your faith is only as big as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move you will be able to do anything. Is that a true statement? Or is that a lie? Oh, no, no, Doug, you don't understand what that means. It's not, it doesn't mean what you think it means. Uh, you have to look at the context and you have to uh, be able to see the big picture, Doug. Um, this is a metaphor. This is not uh, to be taken literally. So I just gave you three examples of what could be viewed as a lie from Jesus' lips. But now let's talk about how Jesus could be viewed as a lunatic. But I tell you that if a man looks at a woman and wants to sin sexually with her, he has already committed that sin in, with her in his mind. 
If your right eye makes you sin, take it out and throw it away. It is better to lose one part of your body than have your whole body thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Does this sound like something a sane person would say? No, 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 Doug. This is just, uh, it, he doesn't mean it literally. He just He's just making an analogy of how, just how important it is to obey God because hell is a really bad place. Jesus led the man away from the people to be alone with him. He put his finger in the man's ears. Then he spit on a finger and put it on the man's tongue. If you ever saw that walking along the street, a per one person doing it to another, would you think that person is sane or would you think that person might be a lunatic? Jesus said, believe me when I say that you must eat of the body of the Son of Man. You must drink his blood. If you don't do this, you have no real life. Those who eat my body and drink my blood will have eternal life. I will raise them up on the last day. My body is true food and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my body and drink my blood live in me and I live in them. Does this sound like someone who is sane and rational or maybe a little bit crazy? Again, the Jews were divided over what Jesus was saying. Many of them said, a demon has come into him and made him crazy. Why listen to him? Then Jesus went home, but again a large crowd gathered there. There were so many people that he and his followers could not eat. His family heard about all these things. They went to get him because people said he was crazy. And the people who believe will be able to do these things as proof. They will use my name to force demons out of people. They will speak in languages they've never learned. If they pick up snakes or drink any poison, they will not be hurt. They will lay their hands on sick people and they will get well. Are these the words of a sane person? Or does it sound like the words of a lunatic? Jeff, when you say Jesus is the truth, the way, and the life, nobody comes to the Father but through him, then why do you believe that statement is true? Well, because he's Lord, you might say. He is God in flesh. But as C.S. Lewis said, well, maybe he's a liar. Maybe he's a lunatic. Or maybe he is Lord. But your own scriptures give evidence that maybe he was a liar. Maybe he was a lunatic. Why do you assume he was Lord? When you guys go into a hostile context these days in a nation that was started by Christians, that's an undeniable fact. This nation, San Diego, exists because of Christians. You're welcome, okay? When this nation was started by Christians, now we have a nation that's broken covenant with God, and we live in a context that is very hostile to the Christian faith. Yes, the United States was started by mostly Christians, but does that make the United States a Christian nation? I wonder how many of the Christians back then you would even consider as true Christians. If you go to public school today, you know what I'm talking about. They don't submit to Christ as a foundation of knowledge. They don't believe Paul when he says that in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. They try to have so-called knowledge apart from God as the foundation. And they run off into all kinds of interesting views of how we should live, what are our origins, and they tell you as a Christian that you are the one who is not walking in the truth. Jeff, I have to ask you this. Do you desire a Christian theocracy in the United States? Jeff, I want to play a clip from Side 10 Bruggenkate, and I'm very curious to know if you agree with him. Do you believe that democracy is the best system in a civilized society? No, actually. I believe theocracy is. Theocracy. Yes. Ooh. Christian theocracy. Jeff, do you want a Christian theocracy in the United States? Do you want Christianity favored, promoted over other religions within the government and public schools in the United States? If you do, what type of Christianity would you want? Would you want this type of Christianity? Or would you want this type of Christianity? Or a different type of Christianity? Would you want the type of Christian theocracy that legislates the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Would you want to put Hindus and Buddhists and mu Muslims in jail? Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Any type of graven image, any type of idol, if someone was to be caught in their home with one, would you want to put them in jail? 
Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Do you think people who swear should go to jail? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy? If someone works on a Saturday, should they go to jail, Jeff? Honor thy father and thy mother. Do you think kids who lip off to their parents, should they serve time? Thou shalt not commit adultery. Do you think every adulterer should go to jail? And if so, if someone confesses that they committed adultery in their heart, in their thoughts, should they be locked up? Thou shalt not covet. Do you think that the United States economy would be hurt if people would not covet things? I want you to consider something. In history, Christians were the movers and shakers of culture. This is really important. Don't forget this. In history, the Christians were the ones that were developing civilizations and developing cultures, moving art and science and reason and education to where it is. If you think about history, Oxford, Cambridge, some of the most renowned and respected institutions of our day, listen, were not started on the basis of an atheistic worldview. Those institutions were Christian through and through, and they were dedicated to the truth and the knowledge of Jesus Christ as Lord. Did you know that? Did you know that some of these atheist professors that work at Oxford and Cambridge and borrow from the Christian worldview in order to do what they're doing. They work in institutions where when they go to work, they have to walk under pathways that say things like, in His light, we see light. It's the biblical worldview that gave the world these institutions. Harvard, Yale, Brown University, all these universities, Christian universities, made by Christians for Christians for the advancement of the Christian gospel made by Christians for Christians for the advancement of the gospel. I'm not a huge history buff, but I do believe that it was the Chinese who started writing first. I'm not an expert in history, but I believe it was the Greeks who started philosophy and reason. I could be wrong about this, but I think there are other religions in the world who developed art, developed science. Notice what Jeff is doing here. This has become a pep rally for Christianity. He is trying to pump up these young people so they say, yes, we are on a winning team. Jeff, can we talk a little bit about how Christianity has held back science? Jeff, the absolute truth for most Christians in history was that the earth was flat that the earth was the center of the universe, that comments were not celestial bodies, but they were fireballs thrown down from the anger of your God, that ordinary events of nature were not caused by the laws of nature or physics or chemistry, but they were the result of magic, miracles, or angels or demons who actively caused and intervened in ordinary events. It was Christianity that believed that both disease and insanity were either punishment of God or possession by devils. Lightning was also considered by many Christians to be a punishment from God. There are Christians in the United States today that because of the literal interpretation of the Bible believe the earth is flat, Jeff. I know, I've talked to them. And the core reason they believe the earth is flat and is the center of the solar system is because of your Bible, the Christian Bible, the Jewish Bible. And it was Christianity that persecuted scientists like Copernicus, who said that the sun was the center of the solar system, not the earth. It was Christianity that persecuted Galileo, who claimed that the earth was not the center of the universe, but revolved around the sun. Rene Descartes postponed the publishing of his book because of fears of the Christian church. Isaac Newton, one of the smartest guys to have ever lived, kept his true religious beliefs a secret for fear of persecution from the Christian church. Charles Darwin withheld his book on natural selection because of fear from the Christian church. Jeff, it's like we have this society that's on a train, and in the front of the train are the atheists and the deists who are making advancements in science and technology. And in the middle, we have the theists, 
And at the back, in the caboose of the train, we have the fundamentalists who are slowing the whole train down. Among scientists, only about a third, according to a 2009 Pew poll, believe in a specific theism, Jeff. And among the scientists, Jeff, only 4% I think you would call true Christians. And among scientists who have PhDs and who are members of the academies of science, only 7% of them have a personal belief in a personal God. And so I want to say this to you today. If we're going to be Christians, if we're going to be committed to Jesus Christ as Lord, we have to embrace truth, love truth, herald truth, cling to the truth, and stand on the truth, God's revelation. If you value truth, I would think you would need to consider the possibility that what you think is God's revelation might not be. Part of valuing truth is admitting that you could be wrong. Let's pretend for a moment that the Bible is not God's revelation. Let's pretend for a moment that Jesus didn't rise from the dead in your worldview. How do you think the world would be different today? Do you honestly believe that there wouldn't be Christianity? There are many religions of the world that you think are false, and I would agree with you, but they still exist. They still thrive. I think if someone values truth, they are willing to admit that they may be wrong. As a believer, I want to say, stand on God's revelation. When you stand on God's revelation, you have a basis for science, the uniformity in nature, that the future will be like the past, that science is even possible. You have a basis for universal laws of logic that are necessary, unchanging. You have a basis for ethics, that there are absolute oughts in the world. Let me Jeff, I can account for everything you can, and I honestly believe that you borrow from my worldview. I can account for science and the uniformity of nature, I don't think you can. If you believe in miracles, that is the suspension of nature. How can you believe in the uniformity of nature if your God can intervene and change nature? I believe that logic is a property of existence and I believe the universe does exist, so I can account for the laws of logic. I can account for ethics and morality based on concepts of well-being and unnecessary suffering. And Jeff, just because you believe in a God, I don't think you can solve the is-ought problem. Just because you believe that God made you and created you and has revealed things to you does not mean you ought to obey Him. One could still say, so what? So what if God said to do something? The best answer you can give is, well, God can throw you into hell when you die. But then your belief system becomes a system of carrots and sticks. So in the last week, our nation has had to face the awful news about a man walking into a club and injuring dozens of people, killing, murdering at least 50, right? Here's the two platforms. Now, here's the thing. In our nation, everybody's grieving over it. Believer and unbeliever alike, grieving over it, saying, awful, murder, terrible things. Unbeliever, believer. Unbiblical worldview, biblical worldview. Now, if I stand on the biblical worldview, and I look into Orlando, do I have a right, standing on the biblical worldview, to condemn Orlando? What happened there? You can answer. God's Word says we're made in the image of God. God's Word says you shall not murder, right? God's Word says love your neighbor as you love yourself. I have an objective basis, standing on God's revelation, to call that evil, to demand justice. I want you to answer the question. If I say Orlando is to be condemned, what happened there is to be condemned. Am I being consistent with what I'm standing on? If I say this, what happened in Orlando is absolutely immoral. Am I being consistent with what I'm standing on? Okay? Now, stand over here on the unbelievers platform. He says that our ancestors used to be bacteria. We're in a purposeless, meaningless universe. He looks into Orlando, standing on his worldview. I want you to ask yourself the question, is what I'm saying consistent with what I'm standing on? Orlando was absolutely evil. It is absolutely wrong to do what happened in Orlando. Am I being consistent with what I'm standing on? Okay, let's try it this way. Ready? I'm standing on the unbeliever's worldview. Our ancestors were fish. We're in a purposeless universe. All there is is time and matter acting. Oh, sorry, time and chance acting on matter. Okay, ready? It is an absolute moral requirement 
that you are to love your neighbor and not eat them. Standing on atheism, is that consistent? Given atheism, why is it immoral for me to eat my neighbor? Why is it demanded of me that I love my neighbor rather than eat them? Given atheism. Jeff is painting a picture of two worldviews. His worldview, the Christian worldview, and the atheistic worldview, whatever that means. But let's be clear. Jeff is not really talking about two different worldviews. He is talking about his worldview, the Christian worldview, and every other worldview out there, including all the other religions. What Jeff is saying here is, if you are a Hindu, if you are a Buddhist, if you are a Muslim, if you are a Taoist, you have no basis to say something is morally wrong. Jeff, I understand you're trying to appeal to the young people in the audience, but you have a huge struggle on your hands. Because these people that you're talking to, these young college students that you're talking to, they know that they're Muslim friends, that they're Hindu friends, that they're atheist friends, are just as moral, if not more, than they are. So pragmatically, Jeff, whether you can account for your morality or not, it seems it makes no difference in one's behavior. Can you provide me with any evidence, Jeff, that Christians behave better than non-Christians? I'm an agnostic atheist. I don't believe in any gods, but I don't say that there can't be one. I do not say there is no god or gods. Jeff, I have a box, and it's labeled Doug's Morality. And in that box, I subjectively put things into it based on concepts like unnecessary suffering and well-being. And when I see an action that goes against what's in my box, I can objectively say that this is wrong, this is immoral. I submit to you, you do the exact same thing I do. You have a box labeled Jeff's Morality. And in your box, you put your God, Yahweh or Jesus. And based on Yahweh or Jesus' nature, you see a specific action and you say, this is objectively wrong. Jeff, couldn't you have chosen a different God to worship? Even if you're a Calvinist, Jeff, don't you believe you have the free will to worship a different God? And put a different God's nature in your box of morality? Jeff, you have subjectively chosen which God to serve. And that is the basis of your morality. Jeff, I don't know your middle name, but let's say your middle name was David. And if I was to call your middle name Peter, I would be objectively wrong based on how your name has been defined. In the same way, we can define morality and look at an action and objectively say it is right or wrong based on how we've defined it. I said that I subjectively put things into my box labeled Doug's morality, but I could even be wrong about that. Jeff, if I was to ask you to destroy these things one at a time, these five things, which thing would you have the least amount of guilt or shame to destroy? And which would you have the most? Would it not be something like the rock, then leaf, then butterfly, then hamster, then dolphin? Why is that? Your holy book, the Bible, does not explain this. Jeff, does God say it is more sinful to kill a dolphin over a butterfly? But there's something inside us that says, yes, there is something more wrong about killing a dolphin over a butterfly or a leaf or a hamster. Why is that? I believe it's because of evolution via natural selection. We tend to say something is wrong based on things that we perceive to be self-aware, based on how we perceive our animals to feel pain. So Jeff, maybe there's a basis for morality that you haven't considered yet. Jeff, what happened in Orlando? Can you really say that that was objectively and absolutely wrong? Are you sure about that, Jeff? What if your God willed that to happen? What if your God wanted that to happen? Are you going to call God's will absolutely wrong? Don't you believe, Jeff, that your God can serve justice? Isn't there precedent in the Old Testament of God doing just that? Jeff, how can you be certain 
that something is absolutely and objectively wrong without knowing if your God sanctioned it first. Oh, no, 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 Doug, uh, God, my God would never do that. My God would never sanction such a thing. Well, my God doesn't act like that anymore. He's, he's changed. Your two-platform analogy is, number one, pragmatically, it does not impact how people behave. Number two, you're saying that not only is the atheistic worldview inconsistent, but every worldview is inconsistent, and yet we do not see any difference in behavior from the Christianity worldview to other worldviews. And number three, we can say we have a basis to say something is absolutely wrong based on concepts like well-being and unnecessary suffering, and other religions use other gods and other concepts to say something is objectively wrong. And number four, I don't think you can actually say something is absolutely and objectively wrong without knowing the mind of your God, who may have willed it to happen. For the next 20 minutes or so, Jeff goes into detail about several prophecies to prove that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. If you're an atheist or a non-Christian and you want to challenge a believer about the prophecies in the Bible... My suggestion is to ask them, how would you make that prophecy even better? What could we add to that prophecy to make it more detailed, more clear, so people who are against Christianity would have no excuse? And when you do that, you'll find very quickly that there's many things that you can add or change to a prophecy to make it more detailed, to make it more impressive, to make it more clear. And when you do that, the person who believes in that prophecy starts to realize maybe that prophecy that I believe in is not so great to begin with. So now we're going to hear Jeff talk about the 70 weeks prophecy found in Daniel 9, 25 to 27. And the 70 weeks prophecy is not weeks as in seven days, but weeks of years. So a week would be seven years. So the 70-week prophecy is actually 77s, or 490 years. How about this? When? Ah, oh, this big. This big. It's huge. Huge. Did you know the Bible tells us when the Messiah is coming? When specifically? So Daniel is in your Old Testament. Daniel is during the time of the Babylonian captivity. If you don't know what that is, you need to get to know it. It's a big part of your Bible's story, the story of redemption. Read your Bibles, get to know your Bibles. The Babylonian captivity is a time where the Jews were put into exile because of their sin. God told them they were going to be in Babylon for how many years? 70 years. So during the end of the 70-year time period, Daniel knows time's running up. We're going to get out of Babylon soon. And then all of a sudden, the angel Gabriel shows up. And the angel Gabriel, very reliable source of information, he tells him that, oh, no, actually, there's going to be a total of 490 years for God to do his purposes, the 70 weeks prophecy. Okay? Here's what he says is going to happen. They're going to finish the transgression, make an end of sin, bring in everlasting righteousness, make atonement for iniquity, and to anoint the most holy. Everlasting righteousness and atonement is going to be made. God's going to make an end of sin in this time period between when the Jews are allowed to go back and the Messiah's work is finished. Did you know that in the first century, listen, listen, did you know that in the first century that all the Messianic groups in that time period were looking around going, where's the Messiah? Where's the Messiah? You know why they were doing that? Because of Daniel 9. They now, this is hugely important, hugely important. If Jeff admits here that people were waiting for the Messiah at that time, and he's right, uh, during that time, that period in history, people were looking for a Messiah. Shouldn't that be a clue that we have some self-fulfillment going on here. This is why some Jews believe that the Gospels are more like a screenplay than actual history. There were probably people running around claiming to be the Messiah, and there were probably people who followed around a guy named Jesus who claimed to be the Messiah. And they did this because of Daniel 9. A lot of the prophecies that you see in the Old Testament were used 
or could have been used to construct the Gospels without it actually ever happening. Now, I realize this is blasphemy to Christians, believers, who say, no, this is a historical record of what actually happened. But what Jeff is saying here is that we have a context where people are expecting a Messiah. They knew the Old Testament scriptures well, whoever wrote the Gospels. They could have used the Old Testament prophecies and loosely base it on a real person in history to create the Gospels without a lot of it actually happening. They could count! They could count! They knew this is the time of Daniel's prophecy. The Messiah is here. They knew that the Messiah had to be cut off and they were waiting. Where's he at? Where's he? Who's the Messiah? You the Messiah? That's why there were so many false messiahs in that time period because that was the time of Daniel's prophecy. There were so many false messiahs at that time, but the Messiah that Jeff believes in was the one real one. But there's more. God said the Messiah was going to be cut off in Daniel 9. He was going to make an end of sin. I believe in every situation in the Old Testament, that term cut off is used in a negative way towards a negative person. Here we have the term cut off used for what the Christians believe, the Messiah. It seems like this would be the first exception. Righteousness. And then, listen, the second temple was going to be destroyed. So, ready? The Messiah is going to be cut off. That means to die a violent death. He's going to make an end of sin, bring an everlasting righteousness, make atonement for iniquity. And ready? He's going to do it before the second temple is destroyed. Okay, I want to present something to you now to show how this prophecy could be made better. So I want you to stick with me and listen very carefully. I'm going to bring up two translations of Daniel 9, 25 through 26. So I want everybody listening to this to picture Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. One person, Jesus. I'm going to read these two verses and think nothing but Jesus. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, Jesus, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks, the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. And after 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, Jesus, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, the end of it shall be with a flood, and till the end of the war, desolations are determined. Now, this is the New King James Version, and it's pretty clear. It sounds like it's talking about Jesus. Now, I will read these two verses using the Revised Standard Version. But instead of thinking about Jesus, I want you to think of two people. And it doesn't matter who these people are, but I want you to think of two people in these two verses. Now listen closely. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, person one, who's a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for 62 weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in troubled time. And after the 62 weeks, an anointed one, the second person, shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. Now, do you see the difference? Can you hear the difference? When I read it from the New King James Version, it seemed very clear it was talking about one person, and that person was Jesus. When I read the same verses from the Revised Standard Version, you can very clearly hear and see two people, two separate people. And not one of them is called a Messiah or the Messiah. So Jews that don't believe that Jesus was the Messiah, they take this interpretation of Daniel 9. It's talking about two separate people and things that need to happen in order for the Messiah to come in the future. But the Christian, when reading the New King James Version and other versions, 
see it as, oh, this is clear. It's talking about one person, and this person is Jesus. I saw this advertisement for an event in Phoenix. I was at a grocery store, and it was the Scottsdale Jewish News. And I picked it up because the Bible says that I'm Jewish. It says those who are true Jews are those who are descendants of Abraham and have the circumcision of the heart and not the flesh. So I was like, it's my newspaper. So, shalom. I grabbed it, and inside the newspaper it said that there was going to be an event where a Jewish rabbi was coming, and it was Jews, I think, against Jesus, or Jews for Judaism, and it was supposed to be a seminar on how we can prove that Yeshua, Jesus, is not Mashiach, not the Messiah. So I go with my friends to the synagogue, I bring my backpack with my Bible, I got to wear a little yarmulke, it was awesome, okay? I go into the synagogue, and I got to listen to this guy talk for like two hours. And he goes on for two hours, not addressing any of the arguments that Christians really, really get to for 2,000 years to prove that Yeshua is Mashiach, that Jesus is the Messiah. And so when the whole thing was over, I was a bit frustrated. I thought we were going to get, we were going to get down, get to business, right? Let's get to work. Let's get into the text and let's do this, right? I'm thinking like the Apostle Paul in Acts 9, refuting the Jews in the synagogues, and they're mad and they want to kill him, right? The church is growing, and then Acts chapter is 18, Apollos is rigorously refuting the Jews publicly, proving that Jesus is Mashiach. I'm like, this is great, right? We're going to get down to it. And so everybody there knew that we were Christians, and here's why, because nobody there had a Bible. Not one Bible. And all these, what do they call it for Jews? Is it pews still? I don't know. Okay. Seats. Right? Every time I'm flipping through my Bible while the guy's talking, do you know this? He even brought up verses that weren't even in the Bible. Maybe other people didn't have a Bible because the Jews used their smartphones, Jeff. He was like, well, this says this in this text, and I was looking, it wasn't even in there, right? But nobody else could, could check because they didn't have your Bibles. They were like, oh, okay, yeah, okay. That's why it's important to always have your Bibles. Bring your swords, okay? So everyone's watching us, so he'd make a point, I'd go searching for it, and everyone's in there like, <laughs> right? So when the whole thing was over and he was finished, I stood up. And I walked down the middle of the aisle to come up right to him. And as soon as I did that, every person in there whoom, converged, right? And now it's the Gentile Christian face to face with this Jewish rabbi who looked a lot like Mahdish Yahoo. <laughs> and he's standing right in front of me. And I said, sir, I just want to tell you how grateful I am that you are here and you, you and let us come in and listen to you. I appreciate the opportunity to listen. And he's like, oh, of course, of course. I said, I just have a question, rabbi. I said, you know, you talked for a while here, but you didn't really address any verses that Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians have been using for 2000 years to prove that Jesus is the Messiah without a doubt. He goes, oh, I address all of them, young man. I address all of them. I said, well, sir, you didn't address even one that I would use. And he goes, okay, like what? And I said, well, what do I, I don't even know. Like, I have some, um, Daniel 9. He goes, what about Daniel 9? I said, well, Daniel 9 says the Messiah is going to come, be cut off, make an end of sin, bring atonement for iniquity, and everlasting righteousness, and then the second temple is destroyed. And he goes, okay. I said, well, Rabbi, when was the second temple destroyed? He goes, well, everyone knows the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. I go, okay, Rabbi, if Jesus isn't the Messiah, who is? And so this rabbi gets the Bible, and he opens it to Daniel 9, and he's flipping to the page, looking here, and he's looking up, and every, every Jew there is looking at him, looking at me, looking at him, looking at me, looking at him, looking at me. They're like just nudging, they're like, just get ready, get ready, get ready. He goes, okay, um, okay, um, he goes, uh, I'll tell you what, um, give me your email address, I'll get back to you. That was it. So Jeff is painting a picture that he showed up this Jewish rabbi. But if the Jewish rabbi, I, I don't know exactly what happened, but if the Jewish rabbi answers the same way as most Jewish rabbis that I've listened to, he would have said Daniel 9 does not speak of a Messiah in the same sense that you're thinking. He would have said the Messiah would come after the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. That Daniel 9 does not speak of the capital M Messiah, but small m Messiahs, meaning anointed ones. The anointed prince and the anointed um, priests of the temple. That they're not speaking of the Messiah that will usher in the kingdom of heaven and the end of time. I made my own spreadsheet where I have four interpretations of Daniel 9. And if you look at the far right side, you'll see two Christian interpretations, and you'll notice they're different. And if you notice the Jewish interpretation, it's different. The Jewish and the secular historian interpretation both have seven weeks or 49 years separated from the 62 weeks, which is in blue. The Christian interpretation cannot account for this mention of the seven weeks in Daniel 9. The secular historians can account for that whole prophecy, which is not really a prophecy because it was written after the fact. So no miracle, no gods are required to explain Daniel 9 to the secular historians. 
The Jewish interpretation is much different, but still has gaps in it, in my opinion. And the Christian interpretation is different than the other two. Remember what I said earlier about how to make a prophecy better? Well, here's a clear example of four different views of Daniel 9, and these views differ because the prophecy is not clear. The 490 years, when does it start? It's not clear. Does the prophecy talk about one person or two people? It's not clear. If it does talk about two people, which two people? It's not clear. And I could go on and on talking about how the Christian interpretation has retrofitted the prophecy to fit just so, changing the definition of year and starting at a certain point and coming up with other fudge factors to make it fit. So Christians, please understand that when you use prophecies like this, and as Jeff said it, to prove without a doubt that Jesus is the Messiah, we don't buy it. There are smart secular historians who disagree. There are smart Jewish rabbis who spent their whole life studying this stuff and disagree with you, Mr. and Mrs. Christian. And you Christians can't agree on exactly the details of Daniel 9 and how it all fits. Jeff ends the video by talking about the symbols found throughout the Bible, that this shows that the Bible is true. And he talks about the transformation of the world because of Jesus. But I'm going to ask the same question I asked earlier. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, do you expect that the world would be any different? Do you honestly believe that Christianity would not exist in the form it's in today if Jesus did not rise from the dead? And if your answer is, of course it would be different, Doug. There's just no way that it would have gone on the way it did and be the largest religion in the world, you then have to ask yourself the question, why is it all these false religions exist today? Why is it that Islam is growing faster than any other religion, and yet you believe it's built upon a lie? Look at Mormonism, how crazy Mormonism is, and even Scientology, and yet it has vast numbers in the United States. Do you really believe, Mr. and Mrs. Christian, that if Jesus did not rise from the dead, that things would look any different today? Jeff, the title of your video was Absolute Proof of Christianity. You talked about how, as a Christian, you should be committed that Jesus is Lord, no matter what, and that no one is neutral. There's the Christian worldview, and then there's everyone else. You talked about how great Christianity has been in history. You talked about how without Christianity, you cannot have a basis for things like morality. And then you talked about prophecies. But I have showed that when you start with Jesus is Lord, you're starting with conclusion, and then you're coming up with reason second. If you are a truth seeker, you should, I believe, look at where the evidence points. And when you start off by saying that no one is neutral, you're creating an us versus them barrier that's really hard to overcome. And I've also shown that you can have a basis for morality without a belief in your God. And all the prophecies that you talked about, especially Daniel 9, these prophecies are not compelling. And I would submit they're not even compelling to you, Jeff, because the reason why you believe is because of a personal experience that you had. And these prophecies become compelling because of that. So is there absolute proof of Christianity in this video? Not even close.